uh, I think a, a good transition to our next uh, uh, speaker. Uh, one of the things that you know Howard and Eugene were talking about was how uh, new threats ultimately become traditional threats, and the the newer threats are even more sophisticated um, and are, you know, are evolving uh, you know, very, very rapidly. So I think it's, it's uh, a good transition uh, to have the head, uh, the director of Kaspersky Lab's global uh, research and analysis team, uh, Constant Ryu, uh, presenting uh, on his topic uh, about uh, emerging threats. So I'd like to invite Constant up to the stage. There is. Good morning. Can you all hear me? Can you all hear me well? Well, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Kostin Ryan. I'm the head of Kaspersky as a global research and analysis team, also known as GREAT, um, which, uh, in case you don't know, this is a group of focused people. We spend their time, we spend our time thinking about future threats and thinking about the ways to fight against future threats. And I think it's quite interesting that um, um, we are living a, uh, in a really, really fast changing time. And I remember actually, and I'll, I'll tell you a story, I'll start with the story. Um, several years ago, I remember, I think it was on um, January 12th, 2010. Anyone remembers anything special about this date? January 12th, 2010. You, uh, I'm sure you can all Google it very quickly and somebody will say it was the Aurora attack. So perhaps some of you remember the Aurora attack. And we are actually, my team was in Moscow and uh, we we're actually at the meeting where the brightest minds of Kaspersky Lab got together to think about the future of the internet and to think about how future threats are going to look like. And that very specific day, Google announced the Aurora attack. And we immediately saw that this was like no usual announcement. This was something special. It was later defined, I think, by, was by Richard Clark, who said a cyber warfare represents the actions of one state uh, against another state in order to cause disruption or damage. And actually, this is a defining point here, that cyber criminals, which are still responsible for most of the attacks on the Internet, are driven by a very, very simple reason. And that specific reason is money. And you can actually you see here uh, Vladimir Tsatsin from uh, S Domains, who made hundreds of millions of dollars through things such as spreading malware and CEO and black CEO, so basically by just uh, committing cyber fraud. But the trick here is that nation states are driven by something else. And to make a parallel to uh, what uh, um, um, Mr. Smith was saying, uh, of course, about the wisdom of uh, Sun Tzu and the uh, analogy with fire, um, it's quite interesting that every now and then, it's usually somebody in the military, perhaps a general or a colonel, and he comes up with the brilliant idea that fighting fire is best done with fire. So they think about, uh, well, if our enemies are using fire against us, it doesn't matter if we are prepared or not. The best way is if you actually burn them first, because if we burn them first, they'll have like absolutely no chance to uh, burn our, let's say, fragile infrastructure. And actually, this is what is happening at the moment with nation states. And most of these big threats that we are seeing, and you know, the dawn of cyber warfare, uh, it all happens because it's, um, first of all, driven by this idea of fighting fire with fire. And the second big idea is that cyber weapons are much cheaper than conventional weapons. So anyone knows how much uh, a nuclear bomb costs? Any ideas? I'm sure some of you know. About a billion, two billion dollars? Something like that. Um, well, the truth is that it costs actually uh, what somebody told me, and I asked this question, I was at the uh, military conference, and there were like a lot of generals in the audience, and one of them said, well, it costs uh, several hundred billion dollars, but you get to make hundreds of them. So the thing is that conventional weapons are quite expensive compared to cyber weapons. And 
going back to the Aurora operation, which was the pretty much discovered in uh, 2009, at the end of 2009, I think it was a quite a defining point in history because it was like the first general acceptance of the fact that nation states are actively developing cyber weapons and fighting against each other. And it's quite interesting to see who the targets were here. The targets were not necessarily another nation state, but they were top companies from that state. Companies like Google and, of course, Adobe, Juniper, Yahoo, they were all hit by the Aurora attack. Um, and you know, it's quite interesting that I spoke to somebody from Microsoft about this and I asked, how come that Microsoft is not on the list of uh, victims of the Aurora attack? You know what I, he said actually? He said like, well, at uh, Microsoft we actually install all the updates and we patch our systems. <laughs> Which is funny because, uh, you know, you'd expect that all big companies actually do the same. But the truth is that patching is one of the big issues. And, um, Patch management itself, I know it's one of the biggest nightmares uh, of, uh, of today's system administrators. But moving forward, um, 2010. 2010 was a quite interesting year. Uh, and actually, that was a year when the first cyber weapon was discovered. And I got the chance to talk to the man who discovered Stuxnet, and it was quite interesting. He told me the real story of how he uh, managed to come by this very interesting piece of software. And the story is that there was a one um, Saturday evening and he was at the friend's uh, wedding thinking about uh, every other programmer thinks about at the wedding, which is of course work. And he gets a call from one of his colleagues who was in the office and he says like, listen, Sergey, we're having something interesting here. Some of our customers are getting a lot of blue screens. Can you, by any chance, I know that, of course, you're having fun and you're very busy, but maybe you can come to the office and take a look. And you can imagine what the answer was. <laughs> he went to the office and, of course, he started looking at this threat. And this is actually how Stuxnet was discovered. Um, and Stuxnet is extremely important because it actually demonstrated and it proved that the computer program can cause physical damage. And the computer program, you know, which previously was uh, never imagined before, it can actually take human life. So such things are actually possible nowadays, and this was demonstrated by Stuxnet. So I remember that we spent a lot of time actually trying to find others. So we, we always thought, perhaps Stuxnet is not the only cyber weapon, perhaps there are more. I mean, it's the eternal question of the humanity. Are, are we the only ones in the universe? Are there others? So, and you know what? No matter how much we search, we couldn't find any others until 2011 in August. And that was actually one, uh, the time when one researcher from Ukraine, and his name is uh, Boldizar Benchat, he was a, a doctor in computer science, he was asked to analyze a very interesting attack against the certificate authority. And this attack was incredibly sophisticated. It was stealthy and elusive. And after he completed his analysis, he was able to determine that this was actually a sibling of Stuxnet. There were actually other cyber weapons out there which haven't been discovered. So this was like kind of a revelation for us. So we, we finally we realized that the trick here is that cyber weapons are not just unique. There's actually a lot of them. The problem is that they are actually very hard to discover. So that's when we uh, started, let's say, uh, one of the greatest, uh, uh, I would say, uh, malware hunts in history. And uh, you can very much make an analogy here, we know with the hunt uh, for Bin Laden. We started looking, trying to find other cyber weapons. And actually, we were successful. In May 2012, Kaspersky Lab announced Flame, which is perhaps one of the most sophisticated threats in history. When fully, deploy, uh, when fully deployed on an infected system, Flame is about uh, 20 megabytes in size. I remember that I said, when the flame was originally announced, people asked me how long will it take to analyze it? And I said it will take about 10 years. And people laughed. And uh, of course, after a few days, as more information became available, they stopped laughing because they understood that they'll never be able, you know, to spend 10 years to understand just one computer program. And Eugene, I think he was saying 
that in the case of uh, Shamoon, how much time did we spend uh, to analyze that? Was, I think it was about half a day then uh, just to understand what it does, and then a few days just to make sure that we know everything about it. In the case of Flame, we spent about one month trying to understand it, but then we admitted that it will take another 10 years to fully understand what it does and what it was actually created to do. And quite interesting, it also in 2012, we uh, found some other things, and perhaps some of you have heard about Gauss. And the guys who uh, created Gauss, obviously they're fans of mathematicians and uh, philosophers. So they actually they chose to name modules from Gauss by famous philosophers like Lagrange, for instance. Um, and um, quite interesting here is that the Gauss is the first, uh, first known nation state sponsored banking trojan so when we saw actually when we saw this malware when we understood that was actually nation state sponsored then we understood that this was actually stealing banking credentials you know what our first idea was that nation states you know are now uh, let's say using cyber criminal techniques to steal money from their enemies to fuel cyber war it was obviously it was uh, like a big mistake because this is not what is happening here you can expect nation states to have a lot of money for these kind of things. So actually we were wrong in that assumption. So what was happening here, they were just trying to gather intelligence about the financial operations of their enemies. So when you can actually understand how your enemies, you know, move money around and what kind of financial systems they're using, you can understand their weak points and of course you can exploit them. So this is actually what was going on with Gauss. But the Probably the best thing about Gauss is that the true purpose remains unknown. And deep inside the Gauss code, there is actually a warhead. And this warhead is uh, multiple times encrypted in such a way that nobody has been able to decrypt it and to actually know what it does. Uh, and this is not because uh, people haven't tried. I can assure you that every single antivirus company in the world the biggest security companies, like the best minds in the world, they actually spend time trying to crack the encryption in Gauss, and all of them have failed. And that is because it is so well done. And what we are saying here is that actually the malware, which comes from basically this, uh, this level, so at nation state level, is a completely different game from that, let's say, produced by cyber criminals. So we still don't know what Gauss is about, but perhaps somebody will find out in the future. Another interesting thing is that perhaps in parallel to the mathematicians team, there was another team which had like a different uh, passions and different hobbies. And they did name uh, their modules with names of famous people such as Elvis, for instance, but they also used other names. And the mini flame, when we're calling it the mini flame, because it was like a smaller version of flame, which apparently could have been active as far as maybe 2002 or 2003. So when it was discovered in 2012, imagine that this thing was already active for 10 years. And this is one of the biggest realities we are facing, which is that malware that we are discovering nowadays has been active for 10, maybe five or, I don't know, three years. And this is like really shocking for us because we never expected to live in such a stealthy world where we simply don't know how many other similar attacks are out there. And this actually brings us to our latest announcement and probably everyone here has heard about uh, the um, Red October and maybe who actually, uh, who saw the movie? Who saw the uh, movie with Sean Connery? It's a beautiful movie, it's a very nice movie. Um, um, the reason why we named the malware Red October, uh, first of all, we uh, were actually, um, we were informed, we basically, we got the sample in October 2012. And by looking at the code, we saw a very interesting name. One of the module names of Red October was MP Traitor. So we thought, you know, it's a pretty funny analogy with the movie, The Hunt for Red October, where the captain is actually, you know, he's, uh, he's uh, labeled as a traitor and as he's uh, flying away with his ship. 
So that's why we decided to name the campaign the Red October. And Red October is uh, one of the most interesting discoveries of the recent years, I would say, because it was extremely, extremely targeted. The victims of Red October, they fell into a couple of categories. And the biggest number of victims were actually diplomatic institutions. So if you're wondering who has an interest to inflect, to, to inf to infect diplomatic institutions, I can tell you, first of all, it's not cyber criminals, because the information that is being uh, held by uh, embassies and diplomatic institutions is of little interest to cyber criminals unless they have the ability to sell that on the black market to the highest bidder. But in addition to uh, diplomatic institutions, Red October campaign has infiltrated governments, energy companies, military contractors, um, oil, you know, oil and gas industry, aerospace. And I would say that overall, this is a very interesting case of an advanced cyber espionage network that has been active for over five years without almost anyone knowing about it. And one of the interesting things about Red October is that they do have a lot of different uh, modules. So uh, when you get infected with Red October, you only get a very small piece of malware. So then the, a profiling starts. So they look at actually what you have in your computer. And depending on what you have and actually what you do with the computer, they will send you dedicated modules for different purposes. And one of them, one of these uh, kind of modules, is actually designed to steal data from mobile phones, from mobile devices. And they do steal data from iPhones, they steal data from uh, Nokia phones, from Symbian phones, and most interesting, they have the ability to infect Windows phones. And it's quite interesting, actually, uh, and this is why we said that the Red October authors actually have Russian-speaking origins. I deep inside the code of Red October, there are several references. So, for instance, when they ins uh, infect Windows mobile phones, they send a message to the attackers which says, Zaklatka installed. Anyone knows what Zaklatka means? <laughs> what does it mean, Eugene? <laughs> It's, it's perhaps difficult to explain it in English, but uh, it, it's, it's, a uh, it's a term which comes from like uh, the um, uh, old, uh, let's say the Cold War times, uh, when such zaklatkas were actually put into the walls of embassies to spy on people. So it's like another translation for the term, a bug. It's actually a bug that you put into the wall when you want to spy on someone. So that's why we believe, and this and other references, that the authors of Red October are of Russian-speaking origins. Of course, this can mean anything. It can mean uh, any of the Russian-speaking countries, like, of course, Ukraine, Belarus, Kazakhstan. Nobody knows for sure where they are actually from, except probably for, you know, for, uh, for the attackers themselves and the people who are hiring them to launch these attacks. But Red October, you know, this uh, is just, I would say, the first big announcement from 2013. And it already teaches us quite interesting lessons about uh, mobile device management. And the fact that information from your mobile devices can be actually quite easily stolen by cyber criminals. Another very good example is that inside Red October, there is a module which is designed to uh, handle USB sticks. And this module is actually clever enough to look at USB sticks and to look for deleted files. When, uh, when it finds deleted files, it will actually undelete those files and send them to the attackers. And if you're wondering why they're doing this, it's actually it's quite easy. Uh, most of the uh, you know, high security installations have two networks. They have computers connected to the internet, and then they have computers without an internet connection. And how do they move data? With USB sticks. So that's why they actually have the ability to find deleted documents on the sticks and to send them to the attackers. And this uh, technique, which we haven't seen in any other malware before, so it's a technique that has been pi pioneered by Red October, uh, I think it will become more and more popular. You know, as cyber criminals learn these tricks used in such advanced malware, uh, you know, in a few years, all malware will be able to do such things if that is useful to them. So just to summarize, 
What I think that we are seeing is that the number of black swans is growing. So what I mean by black swans, uh, this actually it's a term coined by a, a very interesting writer named uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb. And what he actually wants to say is that black swans are kind of deciding events in the history of humanity. These are very rare events. But these rare events, they completely fool any kind of prediction models. So when they happen, you know, when these things actually happen, every, uh, let's say, all the bets are off. So nobody knows for sure what will be next. So what we are doing at the moment, at least at Kaspersky Lab, and I'm sure that other companies are doing the same, they're looking at the black swans in order to uh, try to predict the future based on these very rare events which actually decide the future of uh, IT security. And the thing is that the cyber war which uh, we are speaking about today and cyber warfare, it does have hidden dangers. And a lot of people are actually asking me, well, we are a small company or we are a corporation. What is the chance that we will be hit by this, you know, fight between nation states? And uh, actually what I think here is that there are at least three big dangers of the fight between uh, nation states. So first of all, the ideas from cyber weapons can be repurposed and copied. So as I was saying, perhaps in a few years, all the malware will look on dele for deleted documents on USB sticks and steal them. Secondly, companies can become collateral victims in the cyber war. So you can just be caught in the middle, you know, and uh, you simply can take fire because these uh, superpowers are fighting between themselves. And first, and last of all, I would say that cyber criminals can simply start using weaponized exploits which have been originally developed by governments in their own malware. So Eugene was actually talking about Shamoon. And this, I think, it's a very good example of techniques which have been originally developed by nation states, which are being repurposed and reused. And of course, uh, Saudi Aramco and actually uh, Ras Gaz, a company from Qatar that was also hit by Shamoon, they learned it the hard way with like over 30,000 machines which have been wiped in the attack against Saudi Aramco. So very simple malware, but using uh, an idea which has been pioneered by these cyber weapons. Another thing is that collateral damage can absolutely influence your business. So uh, you can, of course, uh, expect things as uh, cyber weapons hitting you by accident. And this can actually happen, and it has actually already happened. And there is a very good example here. The uh, US company Chevron, I, I think that everybody knows about them. And at the end of 2012, they announced that they were actually a collateral victim of Stuxnet. And the thing with cyber weapons, which have the ability to do self-spreading, so they multiply by themselves and they infect computer systems, uh, the risk here is that they can simply get out of control. So when you have self-spreading involved, there, you know, there is absolutely no guarantee and there is absolutely no way to predict what systems will be affected by this. And Chevron, of course, you can assume they have a lot of things. They have for sure PLCs and they have SCADA equipment. Nobody can say for sure. I don't think there's anyone in the world who can be 100 uh, absolutely sure that Stuxnet doesn't have any collateral effects on their SCADA infrastructure. And Maybe there are some people who say like, yeah, well, we are pretty sure that it will not affect our SCADA device. We are pretty sure that it will not damage our critical infrastructure. But to be honest, um, I, wouldn't be, I, I wouldn't want to be in, the, uh, you know, in their shoes when something goes out of control. And you can be sure that with this kind of thing, something will actually go bad at some point. And Last of all, this is like the worst case scenario. And I think that cyber weapons can actually be tampered and they can be used against innocent victims. And the problem here is that our critical infrastructure is fragile. It has been designed over 20 or over 30 years ago and it hasn't been updated. So as a result of this, these uh, computer programs, they have a huge potential to cause disruptions. And the thing is that these disruptions can happen by accident, 
but the problem appears when they are actually done in an intentional way. And you can be sure that if this hasn't happened yet, it will happen. And it will, when this will actually happen, the problem will be that nobody will take responsibility for that because cyber weapons are pretty much anonymous. So just to summarize, uh, I think that all these uh, threats are, let's say, um, pretty much omnipresent. But uh, if we go down to a very specific example, and I want to show something uh, to you which, uh, in my opinion, is extremely interesting. Um, we have a system which is designed to watch the Internet for the uh, uh, fastest growing threats. So this is extremely interesting to look at because it tells you what is the hottest thing out there on the Internet at any specific moment. And I was actually quite surprised last year on 13 and 14 of December when I saw these numbers. And what you want actually to take a look at uh, here is the total number of users, Kaspersky users, which were hit by this very specific exploit. And the, uh, you know, the cryptic name of the exploit is uh, uh, Win32CV2011 3402.c. And um, perhaps anybody knows what is that? Java? That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good bet. I, I, I have to, you know, to, to give you credit. It's a very good bet. But in this case, it's not Java. Flash? That's another very good bet. I'm sure somebody else will say Internet Explorer. Well, the truth here is that the um, CV2011-3402, that is actually the Duku exploit. So this is an, uh, an let's say militarized exploit developed by nation states or developed for nation states which was first used in Duku in 2011 by 2012 cyber criminals actually st stole they simply copied this exploit and they started using it you know just to infect random users on the internet and the power you know the level of this exploits it is absolutely incredible when you compare them to the let's say the average java things that you see and the thing, the problem here is that, you know, militarized exploits, they have a absolutely completely different uh, dimension when they're actually used against, uh, let's say, uh, harmless, uh, innocent users. Um,